joint, but it was like, you know, for me, I don't know, have we started the interview? Cause I'm like already. <laughs> um, Let me go so, ahead and do the intro. Yeah. I went ahead and started recording, but. Yeah, do that. All right, Talk welcome, about. welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Rob Wallace, this is the Zero Noise Podcast where we engage in discussion about music life and everything in between with our guests. This podcast is always brought to you by Grove Studios, the 24-7 artist and production workspace. Whether rehearsing for your next show, producing a new song, doing a podcast, or shooting a video, Grove Studios is set up for the independent creator. Right now, Grove, Grove is offering subscriptions that can help you get your project or next creation cracking off. To learn more, visit grovestudios.space. We are also brought to you by Leon Speakers, innovators in luxury home audio. Thank you very much, Leon Speakers, for your continued support of our podcast. This podcast is produced by Project Plugin and shared with all streaming platforms through Captivate. Uh, be like to be sure to like, share, and subscribe wherever you are hearing or seeing the podcast. I've been noticing people kind of like who do YouTube videos, they like beating people over the head about liking, sharing, and subscribing. Maybe I should, should start doing that, Kurt. <laughs> yeah, you know, put that Maybe hand like, like, I'm, <laughs> like, share, and subscribe, like, or I'm stopping right now. Yeah. You know, maybe I need if, to start doing that. 10 seconds. I'm stopping in 10 seconds if I don't do 10 likes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. We, need at least, we need at least 50 likes before I hey. keep talking. Hey, the funny, so, the funny is, the funny is, I be seeing my kids, you know, go through this and watch this stuff. They be like, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Like it's like subconscious. Like they, they now, now, is. Kurt, my life's work is to lift music and hip hop specifically as both a historical subtext yes, and sir. the product of American culture, a medium of liberation, and the soundtrack for the search for Black freedom collectively and individually. The hip hop album as a primary source of is a primary source of critical discourse about life in America by those who create it. Therefore, we will not only discuss albums that are commonly regarded as classics or close to classics. I want to know about the music that changed the way our guests thought along the way. We'll explore how music speaks to who we are and who we desire to be. Art is not valuable if it does not challenge, if it does not ask, and if it does not respond. We acknowledge that music decorates time as art decorates space. I ask dope people to come visit with me talk about who they are, who they've been, and what they do. I also ask them to be ready to discuss an album that played a role in them becoming them. You will not hear the music we will discuss for many reasons, but you will never hear it the same afterwards. Therefore, this is a music podcast, but it is a people's podcast. And today, the person is Kurt Wallace, Curtis Wallace, aka CW Creative from the Be Creative Studio. Welcome. Welcome, Kurt. Man, man, thanks for having me. For real, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So, so I encountered Kurt um, at. I'm trying to think about how we first ran across each other, but I remember we kicked it at Buff Surprise Party mm -hmm. and had a lot of common threads. First yeah. of all, Rod Wallace and Curtis Wallace are not. Nah. Related, <laughs> as far as we know, as right, far as right. we know, though, right, right, as far as we know, right, and and what's I what we we kicked it about that we kicked it about yep. both of us being from Flint, both yep. of us being in Flint at a yep. similar time. Yeah, you know, I grew yeah, up man. in Flint. You were there. Yeah, um, which we'll talk about, and plus, both of us being um, supporters of the arts. And yeah, wild. Wild. acknowledging deeper connections between um, the art that we create or the art yeah. that we choose to support and how it interacts with our people. So sure. I know I've given some, but as I do with all my guests, I have to ask this question. Who is Kurt Wallace? Oh, Curtis man. Wallace, excuse me. I'm a... I'm a Man, trying to figure that out still, um, trying to listen. But I can tell you, you know, it, it wasn't until this album we're about to discuss, till, it wasn't until I, when I heard it, I, I, I felt the need to, de to, to define that and to discover that. It wasn't until, so like 2012 is when I decided to figure out who that, who, who is Curtis, you know, like, is he, you know, more than just this, you know, dad, um, husband, um, you know, um, I was working, you know, 
in the school system um, as an educator um, and not and not even doing it in the field of study that I went to school for. So in 2012, it was this album truly inspired me to discover that question, that very same question, because it was a question I asked myself, you know what I mean? And this kind of helped me break that, you know, the shell of, of discovery. And when you hear the songs, you, you, you may understand why, but it was it, it was a space in my life where it was mm-hmm. really needed for me to discover that that question. So, and I'm still in the pursuit. So, but right now, I do I do think I am still that husband, that father. Um, but I think I'm obligated to more than just that as a human being, as a black man, you know, as a father, as a husband, mm-hmm. as a friend to my community. Um, but right now, I, I truly see myself as a in this moment as a vessel. Um, truly just a vessel to to create and, and inspire other people to do it. You know, that's where I'm at right now with it. Um, and, and one thing I typically do, we do, this is Curtis Wallace. The album that we'll be talking about is Black Opera, Libretto, The King's Legend. So we'll be talking about, uh, we'll be digging deep into that, um, digging a little bit deeper into, you know, your ideas with, look at you. See, see this, 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 this is why you're here. See, look, look at this fantasticness. This is why this had to happen. You got things moving and rotating and stuff. Perfect. So you talked about, um, and I want to go through your history, but you almost talked about it as though it was like an existential crisis. Not crisis, but an existential situation where you got to a certain point in your life and you felt like your life had deeper purpose and and I think that that's a, a crucial moment for a lot of men yeah fact. a lot of black men uh, we're you know we're raised to work I mean in many cases we're taught that work is you know I mean I had a, a, a father oh, that wow. worked 32 years in GM and then retired due to his health. You know, I had a mom who worked from the time she was a child all the way until, you know, um, you know, she was essentially in her 60s. And I think that from a generational standpoint, I just don't think that that's what we want to do anymore. Like we don't I don't think that's who we are as human beings. And we try to find meaning of our work. and, And that's the kind of sense that I got from what you just said. Yeah. Yeah, man. Absolutely. I also, you know, I'm uh, this this libretto of kings. It, it it makes me, it makes me think about my my ancestors. You know, mm-hmm. like of of all the work they've done. You know, the work. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. you're talking about that work, that work every day, nine to five, that nine to nine. You know, nine to ten. Work they put in for us to not have to do that. Right, the same thing we've been doing for our kids. You know, to give them a better life, you know, something different. It's like, why should we start the whole generational, you know, thing over? Well, I feel like our ancestors have really created this space and even more so now in the last year where we can, where we can do more than just work. You know, right. like I want to work hard, but I want to work hard at something of creating uh, this, you know, at, at this legacy, not just GM, you know, and nothing, nothing against your pops, you know, but like at the end of the day, GM didn't, didn't see him as nothing but another number, give him a plaque, give him a certificate, great job for thanks for your service. But we can we can easily refill you with the space with somebody with even the same name if they work hard enough to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know I mean? Absolutely. I completely agree. So let's let's kind of back it up, back it up, back it up, back it up all yeah. the way. Where were you born? I was born in Flint, Michigan, Genesee Valley, man. Or Gen- so, yeah. yeah. What is what is what is being from, you said Genesee Valley. Or Genesee, or uh, not Genesee Valley. What's, what's the name? Hurley. Hurley Hospital. Hurley Hospital. I don't know why I said that. Hurley Hospital. Hurley Hospital. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what does being from Flint mean to you? Man, I, I feel like uh, here it means I got to work harder. Um, here... Uh, here, meaning like in this geographical location, when people find that out, <laughs> mm. uh, you know. But to me, I guess I we let's, let's talk about me. I can't really care about everybody else, but absolutely. Uh, 
um, it means, you know, I got to try harder. It, for me, it's like uh, my my zero, my point, my zero start is, is just a little bit, it looks a little bit crazier than others. Um, you know, I, I, I recently went back to Flint, man. The house that I grew up in is gone, bro. It's gone. Like, I went there, I went there uh, maybe 10 years ago when I started my yoga practice and it would look like it, it was abandoned. It was, it had been burned. Um, I went inside. It was only one thing that was not burnt, man. It was this glass door. You remember those glass doors, you know, with all the panes in them? Um, it was the only thing. It was a solid oak. I took that door, man. I was leaving out. I was, and I'm only telling you this quick story because it, it, it's like really my beginning starting point for Flint. Like I grew up there till I was 10 years old. And then, uh, you know, I got, you know, because of the crack endemic, pandemic it, it hit my home it hit my family i was one of those you know products of crack hitting those streets and um you know for me flint is like a bittersweet like i love it but that's where my whole family was destroyed bro uh, but i feel like knowing that knowing what i know about america my family could have been anywhere you know mm -hmm. anywhere on the planet where black people are and it could have been affected it's just like it was 50 50 um you know in flint because they know how you know black people they they know the psychology of us all but anyways backing up um mm. i i grabbed this door as i'm leaving police pull up right police pull up like, hey what you doing you know i'm with my cuz my cuz is still from flint um and he's like, oh shit, you know, he's holding this door. He's, you know, trying not to, he's trying not to let him see his face or whatever. Uh, so I, I'm like, man, you know, uh, in this particular moment, again, I said, I just started my yoga uh, practice, my journey in yoga. And so it took me one day to Flint. I don't even know why. It just took me. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, I grabbed this door. Again, the couch came out. I was like, hey, yo, I got this. My energy's right. You know, I told my, look, my cousin, you know, from Flint, I'm like, my energy's right. I got this. He's like, man, I don't know about your energy. So I was like, I got this. So I, I put the door down and go talk to the cop. I tell him my, my journey, man. It was, it was, it was the first time in my life, man, where it was like, I was really honest, truthful, truthful like in my, and, and I'm talking about like, Every word I knew was like, I'm just about to be vulnerable. And so yeah. I told him, I told him, I told him, you know, about my journey. I told him about, you know, like life or how it took me to Ann Arbor, Ipsy, uh, you know, I couldn't make sense of things. And dude, this dude was like, hey, put that door. He's like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn around, give me your license. I'm going to go to my car and run your place. I don't want to see that door, right? He ain't tell me what to do with it. He just said, I don't want to see that door no more. Mm -hmm. So I put the, I put the door in my car. You know, I moved everything, put the door in my car. Cuss gets in the car like, I don't want to, you know. <laughs> He's right. like, you know, he gave me my license back or whatever. He tell me mm -hmm. whatever, you know, like, uh, great job on just, like, trying to change things. Again, this is a black cop in Flint who, you know, I don't think, uh, you know, had ever encountered something like this. Maybe he had, or maybe it was just refreshing for him to just bump into a brother like that. Mind you, I'm, uh, I took off work and I was in a suit. So I took off, I took off, you know, you know, uh, my, my jacket and all that. So I have a tie on everything. So I think just visually, he already knew something was different. But mm -hmm. I say all that to say that that was my beginning, man. I brought that door home and it was like, I, I felt like I could start over. And that was, that was, and I say it was 10 years ago, but it was 2012. So whenever that was. <laughs> yeah, almost 10 years at least. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, at the time it was, before, I should say. Yeah. it was at that moment, man, I left and, uh, Around that time, Libretto Akeem came out. And so, man, mm -hmm. I started listening to it. I will tell you, what's crazy is, man, that you notice is that that I you notice that it was a moment of like I needed, I needed this, it was a distressful moment for me. And it mm -hmm. was, man. I did not know, you know, what was next. I, I couldn't do uh nine to five, man. I couldn't do it. I couldn't just do that work. Thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like, because I seen it in my lineage. I seen it. You and seen what it is. It. Yeah. And it's just, it's, everything's broken. Everything's broken, man. I, I had a similar experience when, um, you know, I worked in K-12 for a long time. 
Um, and when this opportunity came about, I definitely was in the midst of some major transitions in my life and the life of my family. My, you know, my uh, my father had passed away, and my mother um, had began to get ill. Um, and so at the time where I had this opportunity to interview for the job I'm currently in, which was a a diff a much different situation than being in K-12. Well, not much different, but my my day-to-day -day would be a lot different. I never forget on my way out to the interview, I had such a degree of clarity. Yeah. I had extreme, extreme clarity that this is where I was supposed to be that at this time. Even the, the ride out, you know, if you know, if, if you come from where I come from, riding down, you know, prospect towards Ipsy is it's yeah. a it's a very mind clearing kind of thing blue skies and then when I got in the interview I felt as though I mean I'm a, I feel like I'm an honest guy but I felt yeah. like I had never been as honest and as clear yeah. as I was um and so here I am you know yeah, man. so I can so, so you, you you talk a lot about um you know you talk about a lot about yoga you know, you, you went through what you went through. You had this moment of clarity and um, you started to talk about this journey involving yoga. Can you talk to me about how yoga has changed your life and why, um, you know, why it's something that you're such a strong advocate for? No. First of all, I had to, I had to find a 6'2 black man doing it before, before I told anybody I was doing it. <laughs> That's number one. Um, um, and, I, and I wish I didn't have to go through all that to to express the me trying to change um, my my frequency. Um, what I learned, what, why I advocate for, for yoga and what I've learned from it and why I really uh, push and talk about it a lot, how it's changed me, um, it's just allowed me to get like some focus, man. Some real, pay some real attention to solid things that, you know, help me day to day, that change my frequency. Uh, so I meet, greet, see people that truly feed my soul and help with the manifestation of these goals and things that I aspire to achieve, if that makes sense. Um, you know, for me, I use yoga truly as this way to, you know, center myself, take all the distractions of life away. Because when I, I found that when I do that, again, like I can't, I can't see, I don't know how it works for everybody else, but I try to, to uh, teach my students, um, you know, how it works for me. But in my yoga practice, it teaches me resilience, um, perseverance, teaches me how to love myself. It reminds me to connect to my breath. And it does that all in one hour. So that when I go out into the world, um, I feel like, you know, I'm not really surprised by much. Mm. That makes sense. Like I know stuff is gonna happen, but I'm not surprised by it. And I think a lot of people are, they get surprised when stuff is, you know, happening. You know what I'm saying? I want stuff to happen. It reminds me I'm alive, but I feel like the yoga itself gives me at least this fighting chance to have a frequency to attract the things that are going to be coming into my life, good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's this negative thing, I know that I've attracted it to, at least for me, I know I feel like I've attracted it so I can see this other side of it, right? This positive side. I'm one of those silver lining guys. I'm out from Flint, man. There's no way I can't, I can, you know, not still be in Flint if I wasn't an optimist. Right. I feel like that. I feel like that for real. You know, you know my boy K Hill, and like he gonna get he getting a shout out right now um, on this thing. K Hill, you know, Kelly K Hill. Yeah, that's my that's my best friend. Have Kelly we Hill. talked about Kelly? Me and you? No, nah, because no, nah, because like I see y'all kicking it, kicking it, kicking it. But that I there was one boy. Yo. There's one boy that I grew up with. I can't tell you any other man or boy's name from Flint, Michigan that I hung out with, other than my cousins, then K Hill. I lived Shout two doors down. out to K Hill. K Hill. K Hill. Two, lived two doors down from me, man. Wow. Two doors down from me. Yeah, Small man. world, baby. Yeah, man. Like, every, when I see y'all kicking it, I'm like, 
Man, it's crazy, bro. It is the craziest thing. So, so K. Case. Hill, let me tell you this real quick. So K. Hill was, um, K. Hill was in a youth group with me and Flint called the Gamma Delta Kudos. Okay. Which was like a baby frat in a way. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And yeah. I contend, I mean, shout out to, to John Rhymes um, in Flint, um, lifelong educator, role model, um, you know, ran the broom center, I think, up there for a long time. And I swear to God, I mean, for me, you know, I had, you know, I had decent uh, guidance yeah. growing up with my mom and dad. I mean, they were there, you know what I'm saying? But I promise you, Kudos was taking us to college campuses. Yeah. Kudos had us, you know, um, involved in leadership practices and church visitations and this, that, and third. Shout out to K Hill and the rest of the Kudos that I grew up with. It's, it's wow. a seminal part of who I became. Wow. So to hear you say K Hill name, it just warmed my heart, man. Shout out yeah. to K Hill. Man, shout out to K Hill. And honestly, man, I don't know if I would have found that place. Okay. I don't know if it would have found me because it didn't crack didn't hit his household like that. His okay. dad, his dad didn't, his dad knew. His dad was you know, like I ain't gonna even put nothing too much out there, but his dad knew the game, you feel me? And uh he wasn't he wasn't uh he was he was uh as far as I know, uh, you know, he I don't know if he was a capitalist to the game. But I definitely know he was not a product of the game, if that makes sense. Um, I get it. And and so, you know, I don't know if it would have found me like that. I mm -hmm. I would like to think that the spirits would have led me there, but it, I don't. I think the spirits knew I had to dip to find this space to get to this space. If that, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, man, so, K Hill. So yeah. So yeah. So uh, so for me. Uh, I think you were you were talking about you know reflect man, but like um, for me it's a starting point, and yoga has helped me uh, you know vibrate and and really just truly like uh, understand and just know that that's where I came from. But I have some some work to do, and yoga just reminds me to just tap into um, my center my frequency so I can just stay focused man and I try to just teach people how to stay how to just find you know ways to stay focused but I will tell you this man yoga is the same thing as arting it's the same thing as DJ it's just kung fu man it's just another way it's just another way man to just you know find that space it allows you does it, it allows for individual expression as well fact 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 mm, yeah and, and even in, even in yoga like how you bend how you breathe how you connect, how you move, it's all different. It's for everybody. It's for anybody that can breathe air. If you can breathe air, you can connect to self. If you can connect to self, I mean you you know this. You you breathe conscious air, then you conscious breath, because we do it anyway, right? You breathe that conscious air in there, it stirs creativity to the fullest because you now know that you've given, you purposely said. Yeah, I'm choosing to live, right? I'm choosing it. And when you choose it, and that oxygen hits, and the neurons, and the neural synaptic gap, they, you get those endorphins that you get from, you know, like, okay. like for real, like, you, I finished practice of yoga, I am feeling like I just, like, drank a pint of something. I feel like I done smoked something or something. Like, you get this high, man, because you're consciously in the breath, in the... You know, you consciously pulling in oxygen, you, which means you're constantly for an hour telling yourself, I want to live. Like, I want to live. Mm. I want to live I, to this breath. And if you don't believe that the body will do what it will do to help you survive, I, I dare you to hold your breath and don't let it go. You know, your body will make you release that to tell you, like, you got some living to do. And that's really why I practice yoga, to just remind myself, man, there's some living to do. Period. Wow. So, so I hear uh, in what you're saying, um, one of the things that you mentioned is centering yourself, yeah. uh, which takes me back to, and, and obviously yoga assists with this, but um, the concept of mindfulness. Yes. And my belief is that <clears throat> mindfulness is a technique and a, a concept and a discipline that as men, we don't utilize. 
like we should. Sure. I think that I think that sometimes we confuse um persistence with masculinity. Um we're supposed to work our hands to the ground and I mean our hands to the bone and we're supposed to go the tougher way and the more difficult route um and to acknowledge the need for something like using breathing techniques and stuff like that can illustrate a certain level of weakness which is mm-hmm. poisonous to us yeah can you talk about like through your journey and attempting to employ these techniques like how has it impacted has it has it had any impact on men um specifically and 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 how would you suggest men get more involved in using mindfulness techniques um I, I'll tell you first, first off, um, it's a lot of, I, I lost a lot of um, men as friends when they found out um, I started my yoga practice, mindfulness practice. Yeah, because men don't do yoga, right? No. Nah, like, nah. you know, and so, yeah, I'm so curious about that. Nah, you know, um, black, definitely black men don't do yoga. I mean, they do, but we don't. We don't think they do. Um, in fact, I went to a local space here. Um, I'm not going to give them any any um, credit because I don't want to talk about them and, and keep carry that negative space. But I went there and I tried to do like a men's class, um, and it was all black men, you know. But what what the thing that got them there was a you know a woman, right? Uh, I was doing practicing yoga with this woman, um, you know, and everybody wanted to, I think everybody wanted to be in her space, right? Um, I, w- I was doing yoga in her space. I didn't understand why everybody wanted to be in her space. But for some reason, I told her about, you know, having a lot of men there. And she's like, you know, let's get them. So she put it out. Put out I put out the call, nobody. She put out the call, you know, got like, you know, 10 bite men. But then when I started teaching the class, man, it was... Uh, you know, so much um, resistance. Is that the word? Uh, Could be. To just breathe. It was, you know, a lot of laughter, which is what I get in first time classes. But which symbolizes, it was a lot of, you know, that's obviously discomfort. You already know that. Absolutely, absolutely. And right. I worked through it. I worked through it. But you know, I got on. You know, I got on a, a, a you know, workout outfit talking about yoga, right? And and so you, I got these men who just were very uncomfortable with being in silence in their minds, truly. The silence, you know, um, I say silence because I don't mind the noise of, you know, physical noise, but when you got a room full of men who are uncomfortable with silence because they know we are going to start, we start breathing and we start thinking and start getting into the mind, what I've learned is the, the, and I don't know if this is the right word, but I've learned that like I can do a room full of, uh, I can be in a room full of, you know, white women and they in it. I get a room full of men, it's like we start thinking, we start getting so much in the head, we got so much trauma, bro. Um, but I, it's my constant goal is to get a room full of black men, man. If you can help me figure out that, man, that would be dope. Um, but I, I found that even for me, um, Again, you know, I lost a lot of friends who was just like, it's, 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 it's not masculine enough. It's not mm. masculine enough. Um, and I've just learned, though, man, from the yoga, and I and I forget the whole question, but I've learned from the yoga, man. It's like, I just don't, it got me on such a frequency, man. I just don't care, bro. I just don't even care no more. Um, you know, the same people that hate that I do yoga are the same people that are secretly watching me and, Secretly, you know, when I see him mm-hmm. giving me the shout out because they happy to see that I'm doing my thing. You, know, I'm you always absolutely. Trying to, I'm always you trying have, to encourage them. They can do it too. Right. You absolutely answered the question. It was just what your experience had been involving engaging black men in, yeah. in mindfulness. Um, yeah, and the reason that is so near and dear to me is because I learned about mindfulness when I worked in a school that was trying to shift its practices to being more trauma sensitive. So developing my understanding of your breath and staying center, I always look at it. My, my whole metaphor about it is always, you know, driving down the road and you're in a lane 
And as you you do your breathing, you know, staying in that lane is where my mind is, you know, mm-hmm. as opposed to, and I notice myself kind of drifting into that other lane and I'm like, you got to center yourself. You got to yeah. pull yourself back in. Yeah. And that is, that is, that is very difficult. That is a skill that has to be developed. Yeah. And truth be told, it just, it just speaks to how hard it is for us, Kurt, to just really centralize our focus on one thing. And I mm-hmm. think about, I don't want to get too deep, but I think about when my father was alive, how my father used to um, focus so much on his, on his yard. Yeah. And what I found was it gave him the opportunity to really center his mind around something very specific yeah. Um, yeah. and get into a state of internal harmony in a way. Yes. Yes. Um, like you couldn't tell nothing outside. Because right? I think I think I think even more now than ever, the amount of distractions and the access that we have just using what we're talking yeah, on right now. Yeah. Yes, we have we have the capacity to always be inundated with information and being able to get back to a mindful state is very, very important. Absolutely. So you're doing you, you, you make this shift. Mm -hmm. You're doing yoga. We encounter each other or whatever at some point, but you end up getting involved in the be creative studio. So now you're not only a yoga instructor and an artist and a father and a husband, but now you're running a business. Is that correct? Yeah. So let's talk yeah. about Be Creative and how it started. Um, you know, I've been studying art since I was 10 years old. In fact, Kay Hill can tell you, I was that, I was that kid who could draw. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, uh, a few years ago, uh, some friends of mine, you know, every year now, but a few years ago, some really good friends of mine had passed. My mom has passed, my father's passed, my sister's passed, people have passed. You know, it happens. I'm, I'm reminded of time constantly I'm reminded mm-hmm. of time and that we are not in control of anything and the only thing that has true value everything else is great sweet topics but the true the thing that has the truest value is time because we don't know man we have no idea when it will spin we have no we have no idea how much we have and I'm saying that to say that there's so much and so many people passing I I kind of came to the realization right that I have been studying something for at this point, 33 or 31 years, because I'm mm-hmm. now at the studio for two years or for three years. Mm-hmm. And I had been studying something for 31 years, and I had doing what you were talking about. I had this lane, right, of art, right? This focus, mm-hmm. this place I could focus. But I was finding every reason to turn off this thing. Meanwhile, notice how my hands keep going from side to side. What happens mm-hmm. to get to the other side of this road is I always got to pass through art. I've noticed that I always had to pass through art to get through this other, right? So I work mm-hmm. for a company. I work for a company. Um, I don't like it. I quit. I go back to art. I'm like, oh, it's not making me enough, you know, no financial security because I don't because I don't truly grow. There. Mm. I have to grow in the pain of it, and I don't. So I'm like, okay, get enough, get a job, you know, because I got skills. I know tech. I, and then I'm like, oh, but you, the people here are toxic. That's good. <laughs> right. And so I've done that shift, but I've been in education the whole time with Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti Public Schools. Right. I've just been like leaving, getting a little school, come back with it. I apply for a different job, different spot. Right. And I, and I but so eventually, uh, three years ago, uh, a friend of mine, a really good friend, close friend of mine, we barely talked, but we talked enough. In fact, he has a son and a daughter that are a few years older than mine. And so his son, every time he would grow out of his clothes, he would give them to me. Mm-hmm. Go clothes, always Nike gear, all that stuff. I was like, man, let's go. Clothes to clothes. We saving the earth. We saving, right? And my son will love it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, a few years back, uh, I found out he had prostate cancer. And uh, Oh, wow. Yeah, man. And it was, and he was talking to me and talking to me. And, you know, he's telling me he's feeling good. I was like, where you know, all right. Um, I'm, I'm taking my family, my family and I were going up north, you know, we're going to, to, to Lake Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, two weeks later, we're driving up to Lake Michigan. His wife calls me. Now, I know his wife since high school. They high school sweethearts. But she ain't never called me. 
but she, but she, but I have her number because we friends too, right? I have her number. So I looked at the phone as we pulling, as me and my family pulling up, right? We, I'm, and I'm not bullshitting you. We pulling up into the uh, driveway. I get the call. Look at my wife. Like I show her the phone. Like to Sean. She's like, what? So I answer it, and she tells me the news. You know that he passed. Man, and I looked at the ocean differently that day. Man. Yeah. I get it. Um, I, I, looked get at, it. I looked at the lake. It was Lake yeah. Michigan. I, I looked at it differently. And uh, I just came home, man. I, I came home. I hit mm-hmm. this libretto with Kings again because I kind of listened to it once a week. I hit it mm-hmm. again. Man, and I... Yeah. I, and, and, and okay, so keep in mind, I had also eight years been an uh, art instructor for this place uh, called The Painting Pour. Sure. And and they they get groups of people together. We drink. Yeah. We create. Well, I am, you know, I didn't feel comfortable getting people drunk and sending them home. You know, yeah, you got art, but you drink it. Right. Right. And I, and again, I had been practicing yoga. So I, I wanted to find a way to infuse the mindfulness practice into art to just like, like to, cause I wanted to prove, I still do. I want to prove that anybody can do this. And I, and I stand like nobody, nobody's left my class unable to paint a picture, bro. Right. I figured out how to not teach you how to paint, but I, I feel like I've taught, I've learned how to teach humans how to let go of the things you think you don't know how to do, right? And so I, once I felt like I knew a real a way to explain that, I was like, I got to create this space for people. I was like, uh, the fortunate for me, um, Paint and Pour was about to go under. They had like five spaces. In fact, they told me, they told me, Rod, they said, people in Ipsy want art? I said, yeah, they want art. They said, you got to make um, you gotta make fifty to $75,000 in one year, in one summer, um, from art classes to show us that Ipsy wants. Um, that's how we get um, an art studio in a city, if we make it. So I, I, hit the, I hit the ground, man. I was at Tower Inn, Red Rock, Tap Room, anywhere I could be. I was at parties. I was telling people, like, yo, I made them enough money. They get created a studio. Fast forward, all the studios from um, Royal Oak, Dearborn, Ann Arbor, all closed except the one in Ipsy. The one I wow. helped get started, right? In the wow. neighborhood. You know, because I told them, like, we don't, we, we like art. We just don't want to drive to Ann Arbor to get it. You know what I'm saying? Say what that. About? Wow. Right? And so yes. it, it stayed open, stayed open. Um, I got the highest. Uh, requests for artists from Google, Domino's, from everywhere, dude, like, I'm still to this day are my clients, um, and, and so they were like, we bought the clothes, I was like, you know what, my friend died, I'm opening my own, you know, if y'all don't like it, we can be, we can compete, otherwise, you know, I already got my clients, they were like, nah, bring it in, you know, bring it in, we'll help, we'll actually let you keep the space until you can cultivate and create, um, you know, a real, real good, get you a space. Man, I was three days, three days before they closed shut stuff down, man. I was about to sign um, some papers to give myself a space. Amen. And it'll still uh, happen. And I'm going to tell you why. If I yeah. can, let me pause you right there. Yeah. Why do you think what made what you were doing so successful? Why? Uh, and, and, and here's the real intricate, the real, the real question. Why is it that people who experience what you do, they tend to call you back? Um, I know why. I know why it's not. I think I know why, and I keep I, I keep doing it because I know that's why. To few few reasons. Number one, right off the right off the bat, my blackness. I it is not the norm for them to have an artist, not just you know be an artist, but an instructor. Um, be black man and knowledgeable, mm. right? So I'm not just up there entertaining. I'm actually teaching you art stuff, and I think right away that gets people because you're you, we're used to seeing the Bob Rosses of the world. We're used to hearing the the white names of artists, but so I think that's right off the bat. Then secondly, what I do is I am number one, 100 always myself. Meaning, whatever comes to my mind appropriately, right? I'm professional. Don't get it twisted. Whatever comes to my mind, I say it. 
Ethic. right? Like, you know, and I think that people, it's refreshing to people. I think it's mm-hmm. refreshing. And then I also have this ability to, again, get people to do something that they even started. They were like, I hear them before class, like, I don't know. I don't think I can do this. I'm hearing them. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, and challenge, challenge, right? I got you. And I'll focus on that that person that, that says they can. And it's usually the person with the lowest frequency. They, the people with the lowest frequency will tell you, they will tell the whole class that they don't even know. Like, I don't know. I don't know. You think you can do this? They'll try to convince people that they can do so I go so heavy on that person that I think a lot of the class will see that I change the energy of that person. I change the frequency of that person by just helping them be present, you know, to not even, I call it beatboxing. I call it beatboxing. I say, you're not allowed to beatbox in my class. There's only one type of, there's only two people that could beatbox in my class. The human beatbox and Dougie Fresh. Those are the only two people. And I'm going to play those if you request them. Right, but other than that, there's no. Ah, I can't. Yeah, Curtis. What? Shit, girl, can you do this? I don't know if mine ain't right. Right. I call it beatboxing. So I say, look, first of all, none of that, and that's how I present it to him. And mm-hmm. I just feel like I found a different way to present art and creation. Um, on a canvas to people. And I think it's just, I, I think people respond. And I know that the pain poor and the artists there hate it. They hate it. I was making 150 to you know 300 bucks uh, tips mm-hmm. every time I had a class. They didn't understand why. But it was just like, I'm doing the same thing y'all doing, same pictures. This is you, they, have, they don't have the ability to, you know, really, I think, um, be themselves and teach, right? I've learned how to like intertwine and like it's myself. Either you gonna do it, you're not gonna do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just think that's why people come back, man. I, I I don't know, man. But I've had I've had a second grade class come to me twice during the pandemic in right. Louisville, Kentucky, bro. Right. So you're doing this virtually. Yeah. So I took it you virtually. Know. Yep. And yep. and doing it, and you know, you you did it. You did it with the organization who, that I work with too. You yep. know, last year. And wow. you kind of alluded to this by talking about, you know, playing human beatbox with Dougie Fresh. But there's a deep connection in everything that you do with music. Absolutely. Um, and why music, music, from what I know about you, music affects your group sessions. Music engages with your yoga. Yeah. Music engages with what you do individually in art. Wow. Yep. So what role does what role does music play? Uh it's my harmony, man. It's it's um music is my director. You know, music is my it, music is like, you know, if I got a quiet room and somebody's like humming a, you know, Justin Bieber song or whatever, I automatically get a way in to connect mm-hmm. to people. Music is a heavy connection. Music to me is like you know, if I can get that one person who's like, mm, like, uh, I got that yummy, yummy, you know, like, okay, yeah, get that yeah, person. Yeah. I, I'm like, get that person's energy. Then it, then that from the music, it'll get other people, man. Music is so, it's so dope to me, man, because it really does create and can generate a feeling. You know that fully, yeah. man. Um, um, and and to me, it's just like, um, I hear it. I hear it all the time, man. I hear it when my fan blowing. Um, I, I even when like I have yoga classes and and it's not even it's not even just music right I guess I'm a, I'm gonna change that it's not even just music it's sound man because even in some of my yoga practices we outside I don't have music on but I remind them that we can hear twenty four thousand sounds at once if we, if we focus in mm-hmm. and we start hearing the birds chirp you know the truck like oh, you know like the breeze oh, Wow. Right, there's just music, man. It's just sound that's everywhere, man. I, it, it's hard. It's hard for me. And I talked to you about this when we were at Buff's uh, party, man. I, it had me emotional. It still got me emotional, man. I realized I have not ever created any piece of art without sound. And I'm talking about mm-hmm. majority music, but without some sound, kind of sound that that helps me flow through it. 
Right. If that if that makes sense, man. Just so this 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 album right here in particular is one of those ones that took me um emotionally through so many paintings, emotionally through so many like moments in life. It's still to this day, this album right here. Um, I listen to it, like I said, once a week because there's so many hidden messages in here on how to just be present, mm. to just be present because we can't control like what the world is doing. And I only say all that to say like, I, you know, I really don't feel like I would be able to even show you visual colors and things that I'm seeing without music orchestrating it all, man. It's crazy. Um, I remember I remember an interview with Kanye West talking about like he sees like waves and stuff. And it was crazy to me because I really didn't understand this dude mm. when he said that. But it wasn't until this past, you know, a few years, man, that I'm really understanding. Um, I'm really, really understanding, it, especially since I met a you. Mm. Somebody who has really learned how to interpret music into life. And so you kind of really help me recognize what I was doing. You know, I wasn't just, I'm not, I haven't been just listening to this music to help me with art. I've been using it as like my diary or my uh, guide to survival, bro. Hip hop is, and music has been my guide to survival. Like, I, you know, anybody, you feeling bad? Music. You feeling sad? You know, music. You want to unsad? Music, right? You want to join? Right. Music is what do you pick? Is it gospel? Is it Sunday? Is it R and B? Like whatever you know. And it's and, and what I love about it, it's something for every emotion, you know. And and sometimes, right, I'll listen to some classical music. Sometimes it's jazz. But either way, man, there's music popping off every single. Absolutely, time. absolutely. So so, um, I remember, uh, we were. It it was after the podcast had, I mean, after the pandemic had began, we were coming to the end of production. You know, we, we one thing I talk about in the documentary for Formula 734 is the fact that, you know, everything kind of paused. You know, when the pandemic happened, we pretty much had the album, but we still had some things to do, but we kind of paused everything. Yeah. And then when you know once you had got past that initial shock of okay everybody is at the crib right now everything yeah. kind of stops i'm locking down and you know this that and the third then we got back to the point where it's like yeah okay so yeah you know let's let's go ahead and let's get this done or whatever and when we talked about cover art the first um idea that we had was we have to engage with a local artist right um it has to be an original piece and you were the first person that I thought of and made the phone call to you and you got on it. Um, and as a part of it, I sent you the album to listen to. Yeah. And can you talk us through, cause, cause that, 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 that painting now has become, it's kind of taken on a life of its own. Yeah. And that was my intent in saying it has to be original art. Cause I yeah. like for everything that I do to be some level on some level to be original art, unless I got to do it myself, where I'm right. probably taking a crappy picture, still you know, and, and keeping it like that, you know. Um, but uh, walk us through what that was like. Walk us through that process and, and how it came to be. Oh uh, man, it, or, or I guess how it came out, so to speak. Well, you know, right away you asked me to do it in my head. I'm like, I'm about to do this piece that's about to be, you know, the struggle is real. You know, we we seen right. George. We, you know, we was we was it was just so much, man. It was so much. Um, but then yeah, man, you gave me that album, bro. I listened to that album a couple of times, man. I, I found myself, you know, crying the whole time, and I also found myself like, dang, that album went so fast for me. And it started making me think about my son, man. Then it started making me think about my students. And it started just making me think about, you know, the kind of art that I create. And, you know, Ma, you know, I talked to Ma, you know, a while back, how, you know, I said, man, you know, I can't make art that's that's got pain on it, man. I was like, I go through enough of it. I don't like, I don't like people seeing it. I don't like perpetuating pain, man. 
you know, I've realized that I've, I'm a portrait artist. I've been drawing and painting people's emotions, you know, but mostly, you know, happy emotions. No, no clients want, you know, their portraits of someone, you know, being mad or whatever. But I realized most of my art has been um, built and created to perpetuate uh, visuals of of happiness, of positivity. Mm-hmm. And so my first vision of, you know, cars exploding and stuff, you know, and uh, it became like, okay, I heard all these young men's voices. And what I hear in these voices is, is like, they're different ways of survival, right? The, how are they surviving? But I also hear in them that music is this, this space, this epicenter where, you know, they, they come here and this is where they feel safe. Mm-hmm. And and even um, a, a young man in the documentary looking afterwards, man, this dude, man, he I, I feel like a lot of it, the energy was it came from him. But and I don't know his name. But so then what happened was I, I drew it out. I had cars exploding in the back. I drew this kid who was just kind of looking there. And then I, I met this kid named Howard um, Williams. And I think, you know, yeah. him actually. shout out to Howard. Of yeah, shout out to Howard, man. Really, Absolutely. Really good young smart dude and uh because i'm doing work with uh, educate youth still and mm-hmm. i was like oh yo man you know i want to be able to give you some money too because i see what you're doing out here he's interning and stuff and i'm like man i, I want to be able to put some money in your pocket you know perpetuate what i'm trying to talk about which is you know put money in black man hands and you know uh trying to trying to build some equity i can't ask people to do it if i can't do it and i was like okay let me let me try to kill two birds with one stone so i hit him up he was like cool we went and took pictures all over Ipsy. And I finally, we went up to the top of Ipsy uh, Cross Street. I saw the tower. I saw Easter, man. I saw him. And 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 what's crazy is, Rod, I said, come. I said, I want to have you uh, come like you normally would, tra- like, like like you going for the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. He said, okay, this is how, that's how I normally do. And you know, like, and you know, like coming, coming into, uh, you know, this, 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 uh, or I'm sorry, meeting this guy to me who is um, just so willing to be present with me. Yeah. I saw him and I saw how his day to day sort of life was going. And when I saw him standing at the top of that hill, man, and I started thinking about the stories that I had already, you know, heard in this in this music you gave me, I just came up with it, dude. And it was like, I was just like. I saw it. And and so what happened is, and so you can look at this picture here, right? And you'll mm-hmm. see him with the backpack. You'll see he's got, and you might not have noticed this, but you see he's got his ID visual, visible on his backpack so you can see it. Mm-hmm. You'll notice that it's turned vertical. Not that he's underage, but I wanted to, I wanted to give the viewer to know like these, a lot of these guys are not adults yet. Like look at his ID, like it's vertical. Right, look at that. It's just a little small thing in there, but if you look at his ID, it's vertical yeah. inside there. It's not turned sideways. You see his two bottles of water so he can stay hydrated, right? He's trying to do his thing. Yes. To survive. What I also created was this long, windy, windy, windy road that he has to get to this institution, right? Yes. And, and from this institution that he has to go to down this winding road, I want you to notice his face. That not only can he do that, that he has to or feel obligated to do this thing, but we got, we do this thing with a smile on our face because they already want us to be looking mad and mean mugging. Like, not only are we going to do it and get to this and go through this windy road where notice how you get down to the windy road, it's get, it gets a little dark and gloomy, but then you make your way back up to the top, you know, everything, the lights there. But I wanted to really have a lot of green, a lot of freshness. I wanted to yes. really like express like this green all this to represent not just green, but just like this green on earth and this just money green. Um, and I put all this in really so anybody can see, but I get to talk to you about it. But it, to get to this institution of green, to get to the green, um, he has to go down the, through this winding road. And I don't know if you know what um, shoestrings on a, on, a, um, on the line mean, but you from Flint, I have a pretty good idea that you do. But if you don't and you're tuning in, um, let the it, people it, know. Huh? I'll let the people know. It, it, it represents um, um, the passing of the life of someone um, in the hood. Um, 
it also represents um, resurrection and, and, and growth. Uh, what's funny is, man, I, I went to Flint um, one year. I visited Cahill, who was doing our thing, um, visiting some friends, and it was called me College Boy. And I remember leaving, man. I was feeling so bad that these dudes was calling me College Boy. I was so mad, man. I almost wanted to, like, and these are, see, these are some Cahill friends who were not where me and Cahill was, but me and Cahill was just visiting for like a holiday from college. Uh-huh. So it was one of those moments where he was like, man, let me get you out of here. Because like, they, they, this is what they do to me, whatever. Right. And and I remember, I'm saying that to say, like, I remember uh, that feeling like, like I couldn't, like this was the wrong thing for me to be doing in that space. But I kept, I kept on doing it. And when I was painting this, it reminded me of that, dude. It reminded me like, you know, like you doing it alone, right? When I went there, anyways, I took my shoes and I threw them on the line. Like I, and I told K Hill, I was like, I ain't never coming back here, man. I ain't never moving back here, dude. I ain't never feeling like what I'm doing is wrong. I'm never going to do that again. And so for me, it was also, I was kind of re- reborn in myself. And also you might not know like this, this painting kind of resurrected me into another higher focus. Um, Mm -hmm. This painting, while I painted it, I listened to Formula 734 the entire time. Every stroke that was put on this canvas had their music present in it. I didn't listen to anything else. Um, I think I listened to the album maybe 20 something times before I finished this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and really, I just wanted um, to just do my best to represent. And then also too, this is gonna be my son one day, man. And I want, I want my kids to, when they see my pictures and people see my pictures, to, to have this impactful meaning, but not be all this negative space. I don't want to create another 12 years of slaves, my nigga. We done seen, we done seen those stories. We have seen and the depictions of us in these negative lights. And so I'm not, I just, as an artist, I refuse to do that stuff, man. I'm not doing that no more. I'm not ever, I'm not ever going to be the, the artist you, you want painting uh, some kind of destruction. And I, and it's, that's, to me, that's my, like, my point of what makes me Curtis. Like, so if you like, Kurt, I got 20 grand for you, but I'm going to need you to, uh, to create this. It's like now I get this this opportunity to say here's where I stand. I just don't do that, right? I, um, I, I wanna. I, I just wanna point out that um, things that I picked up on is I definitely um, know where I feel like I know where this picture was taken. Yeah. Um. You know, and, and I did notice how the street goes down into like a winding road. It's almost like an odyssey, like, um, like a, I don't want to say Lord of the Rings, but it's like a, like an adventure is ensuing yeah. with dangers untold. Pass. And Pass. even though, even though, you know, Ipsy pales in comparison from a geographic standpoint, right. To some other areas that young black men have to traverse um just in terms of danger the dangers are not necessarily just physical dangers Fact. you know what i'm saying Fact. so i know that always the winding road yeah. right and yeah you can see you know the tower and i think that's like pray herald or saint or the hospital in the back yeah, yeah the two yeah. tallest buildings in yeah. in the area and um it just it just it reminded me about how I used to walk. I'm from the south side of Flint, and I used to walk. Um, when when I was a freshman in high school, I caught the bus to go to school, and the bus, in the bus, I, I grew up in the valley, and I had to walk about a, I had to walk about a half, maybe about a half mile from, you know, from Dort, from essentially like Ooh. center, from like center in Kent. You know where uh-huh. Wally's East is? Yeah. Deeper into the neighborhood, closer down by uh uh the, the T I don't know if you know the South Side, but like Gil yeah. Martin. Yeah, 
and Gil Martin and uh and Ken. So I remember just walking and I didn't have to walk to school up to that point. I always got dropped off this, that, and the third. And I would have to walk in like abject darkness. Yeah. You know, oh. some mornings, some mornings. And I never felt that I was in danger, like somebody was gonna rob me or take something from me or anything like that. But I think about from a physical standpoint, you know, the fact that we had, you know, when I worked in Detroit, we had students that was walking, you know, a half mile at 5.30 in the morning to get on the bus yeah. to come out to Rude where I work. Um, and how there's a level of adrenaline that is heightened just based on where we live. And that's yeah. only one tier of the game. That's only one yeah. side of it. The yeah. other anxieties, the other um, factors that involve our success and failure are within those trees that you put yeah. on this painting. Fact. And so Fact. it really, it really, it really encapsulated everything that this project was about. I noticed the mask. Yeah. You know, um, this Don't happened to miss it in the midst of a pandemic. So what, what yeah, Howard's is. face, what Howard's face says to me is I'm, I'm going this way and I have what I need yeah. via the water. I have, I have my nourishment as I go into this and his face illustrates a certain level of determination. That's right. That's right. And I wanted that to, and I also wanted to let people know we wake up having to go through this Every day. Absolutely. Every day. Every single day. We know this. This ain't new. Absolutely. You and know, we yeah, could have spent our time today. We, that that we, sense of determination, knowing that you uh -huh. don't know what's down in that winding road. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we, we could have spent our time today breaking down Formula 734. For sure. We want everybody who's listening. Check out Formula 734 at formula734.com. Absolutely. Formula734.bandcamp.com um, to purchase yes. it. Also, there is a corresponding documentary that you can kind of get oh a visual God. of Ooh. on the website. Um, it is a project. I probably should have explained this a little bit more. It is a project that from Washington County, my brother's keeper, where we actually uh, chose a group of artists across generations and engage them in critical discussions mm -hmm. um, through um, discussion circles about specific topics and then turn yeah. them loose in the studio to make music about it. Yeah. And uh, so. it was a very important experience for everybody who was involved. Yeah. Um, it has played a major part in my research. Um, I believe that it is a model that can be used in a number of different spaces. Um, and the film can be used to illustrate how to engage and interact with um, young, Af with, with African-American men in a different mm -hmm. way. Um, yeah. So it's a value, it's of overall value to the community. And I'm very proud to have been a part of it. Shout out yeah, to me too. the me approachable too. minorities, True Classic, DJ TJ, yeah. uh, Sam Watson, um, Lou Picasso, uh, Ray. Don't forget nobody. Um, Don't forget nobody. Dejan Cooper. Um, yes. Oh man. Uh, my man, Conflict from the D. Um, yeah. Oh my God. You know Bro. you, Buff. Um, you. Yourself. I think. I think. I think that's pretty much everybody. If I forget you, just you know, blame it. Blame me not having no coffee this morning, but <laughs> it, it is ab it has absolutely been a life changing experience to be involved in that. But today, we're yeah, going to talk about libretto, an album that you turned to to for meaning, um, to center yourself, mm -hmm. as you said, as you told us earlier today. Yeah. Um. So. Let me just give paint a little, a couple of things, and then we can kind of go into it. So the Black Opera was a project or a, and an, an, how can I say it? It was an initiative um, by Buff One and Majestic Legend, who both were very accomplished hip hop artists 
um, yes. up to this point to do something different. Um, and they began by, you know, they, they, they began with essentially there was a trilogy of albums that came out uh, that essentially spreaded the warning, so to speak. Um, the first one was called Overture and mm-hmm. I don't have the date in front of me. I've, it came out a few years before this one. Then you had Intermission and you had Libretto and Overture had very traditional sample based production. Yeah. Production by Apollo Brown. Shout out to Apollo Brown. Yes, shout out, shout out, out to Apollo KT Brown. Project, yes. you know, production oh by KT. Gosh. Intermission was a little bit more of the same. It was a little bit more refined and then Libretto was a little bit more experimental principally yeah. because um, libretto was produced by a gentleman named Astronaut from France. Yeah. I talked to Buffy. He yeah. told me he was from France. Yeah. And it was a little bit more original. Um, and they had really, really refined their sound by that time. Now, yeah. again, this came out in October of 2012. And at, this, at the time when this project came out, you were making this transition that you've spoken about. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about um, just for the sake of argument. For me, I was this was my first year as a principal. I know it was my yeah. I was wow. Yes, I was a principal at this time. I was a principal in Dearborn Heights, um, and I needed to be centered, brother, because I needed this album. <laughs> but mm-hmm. although I didn't engage with it, to be honest with you, I didn't engage with a lot of Buff's music until I engaged with Buff. Buff, yeah, um, right, exactly. And you know, he has um, even. I, what I will share is that back in the day when I was in Ann Arbor, um, you know, living in Gret, finishing school at Eastern, um, I knew about Buff One, Majestic Legend, Funk Intelligence, uh, yes, Artful yes. Dodgers, Athletic Mike Lee, that whole enclave of artists or whatever. And um, after connecting with Buff. When I connected with Buff, I knew his name and he introduced himself um, at a my brother's keeper meeting and him and I started to talk and we said, hey, it'd be cool to do a rap project with young men. Yeah. Um, and lo and behold, it ended up happening. You know, you put things in the universe and it happens. Mm-hmm. But what I 